this is me talking with my game because we obviously have been having technical difficulties um, with computers on the main end, and I don't want a chance I'm going to freeze up on you. I think you'd rather see me do an art in action as opposed to my face. Plus, you can't pick my hands out in a lineup. You could my face. <laughs> Um, please utilize the chat because I have been noticing a few comments from people saying they're having a hard time hearing. I would love to know, can you hear me? Am I clear? Can we get a yes out of a few people in the chat? All right. So it's not me. My hands are talking good. Excellent. All right. Um, again, thank you so much for joining me. Today's class is going to be all about watercolor pencil, tips and techniques, and pastel pencil. Um, tips and techniques. Uh, Julia Madalena is another one of General Pencil's artists on the team. And last fall, she did the very first pastel class for General Pencil. So I'm kind of adding on to that. So we will make sure we find um, the link, the time, the info for when that class was going on. So you guys can go back and watch that one as well. Um, I'm gonna start out with watercolor pencils. Um, this actual piece of art, it's much bigger, but I zoomed in on a little, was all created with those general Kimberly watercolor pencils. The reason they are my watercolor pencil of choice is notice how it glows. Can you see the, the white of the paper filtering through in areas? That's what makes a watercolor glow and come to life. And you need um, a artist quality transparent pigment in order for that to happen. And General has managed to do that in their watercolor pencils. There's a lot of other watercolor pencils out there. They're more that are artist grade gorgeous, but they're bold. I tend to lean more towards them for mixed media because they are more opaque. Um, General's, um, Michael's carries the 24 set of the Kimberly watercolor pencils and the 12 set. So I wanted to show you that packaging. And again, all packaging art for our products is actually done with our pencils. So you can see the quality of them. I always like to point that out because that's not always the case. Um, I love watercolor, been doing it 35 years. What made me start incorporating watercolor pencils in my watercolors or creating art by themselves with them is look at all the additional mark making effects the pencil tip can create that a brush stroke just can't. So that excited me in the beginning because I'm all about the unexpected mark in my work. I think it, it um, draws the viewer's eye in um, and makes them linger a little longer, uh, which is the goal of my work. I want them to enjoy it and want to stick around and watch a little bit. So the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about watercolor paper. Uh, because we've noticed in a lot of past classes and comments, that's the, those are the nuggets that a lot of people want to know. So they're working with the right materials so they have a better chance of success. If you're using the wrong materials, no matter how talented you are, you're, it's going to fight you and possibly not even give you that intended look you were looking for. So watercolor paper comes in rough press, cold press, and hot press. Rough press is very textured. I love using that if I want a textured effect. Um, I use it in landscapes a, a lot or um, an old barn, a fence, a covered bridge, something like that. When I'm doing florals uh, where you want it to look more delicate, then you wanna go with the cold press paper. Hot press paper is so smooth, the water sits on top of it for much longer so you don't have as much control with that paint. It's really good for if you want to work really looser or abstract. And remember, this is being tape, guys. So uh, my advice to you is watch. Don't necessarily write notes yet. You might miss something really cool because I'm going to throw a lot in in a short amount of time. Okay, so hot press, cold press, rough press. Uh, the weight of the paper makes the difference. This is 90 pounds. Very, very floppy. Can you hear that? The, um, I'll practice on this, or this is what I create my paper palette with, which I'm gonna show you later. 140 is firmer 
300 pound is very, very thick. Um, if the more water you're using, the heavier paper you want. That it's as simple as that. And for the majority of my work, 140 works just fine. That lake scene that I showed you in the beginning, I used a lot of water in that, didn't matter um, because I evenly wet the paper and it um, accepted not only the water, but the color the way I wanted to. Okay, and then this is Arsh. Arsh is, it's just my watercolor paper of choice. There's several out there. Play around, find what's best for you. Um, vellum finish, what is vellum finish? Vellum finish is extremely smooth. That's usually uh, with drawing papers is the vellum finish. Um, vellum, you gotta be careful when you work with vellum too because a lot of it um, uh, propels the water. You have to have an absorbent paper so the water has somewhere to go. I hope that answers your question. You know, if you guys have additional questions afterwards, feel free to email me just in the subject matter, right? Michael's class question. And Julia will put my email address up there for you guys, okay? All right, so no matter what the weight, especially like the 140 I'm working on today, I don't know if you can see all, you see all these little pucker marks. This is the rough side. And then this side is much smoother. You do not see those as much. And again, flowers, I tend to work smooth. The rougher side, um, I will do um, items that are textured. <clears throat> okay, first thing you're gonna do, um, you draw and wet with it. Uh, notice where I'm holding my hand though. My hand is not tight down here in a handwriting position. I only do this when I want to do tight linear detail lines, right? My thumb's always in between the, where it says generals and Kimberly. You wanna be back on it a little bit and you want a light touch, <clears throat> excuse me. If you want the color darker, you don't press harder. You go back and put a second layer on. If you want it even darker, you go to town. Oh, you forgot something. So you go back home and get it. And then you go back to town. Never press harder because this paper has cotton linton fibers in it and you will create a gouge in it. And when it rains, where does all the water go? It goes to the low spot, it goes to the ditch. You're creating a ditch. You're gonna wet it all. <clears throat> it's gonna look like it's everywhere, but you're gonna watch it find the low spot. So don't press hard, just layer more, okay? You don't need a lot of water in your brush. You're gonna make it nice and wet and shiny, and you're gonna tap it and take about half that water out. The more water in the brush, the lighter the color is going to be. You could even draw this dark, but it's going to look lighter because you're going to be diluting it more. So you always want about half of a brush load. I make sure there's no little water drops. I flick it off because that water drop when you're working could drop in there and it's going to create a watermark. A watermark is the brown ugly spot and that happens when you introduce additional water into an area that's wet. When more water than exists on the paper is introduced, that's what causes those ugly marks when it dries. So lay it down and just stroke that brush back and forth till all the lines dissolve. And then this, see, it's the same color, but you see the range of color that you can get from this, from light to dark. Now on my screen, it looks like there's lines. There really isn't. If this paper holds so much pigment, it's going in between all those pockmarks. That's because you want a paper that is going to absorb all this. Now, you can also create two colors right at once, just by laying a little darker. That's what I love about this. You can't get that in regular watercolor. You gotta lay the first color down, wait till it dries and then come back in with a second layer. Not the case with the watercolor pencils. Now watch how this is gonna go out. It follows the water and you get all these gorgeous values all in one stroke. On dry paper, you can leave it alone or you can run a damp brush over it to give a wet look like you loaded it with a liner brush. 
If you want bold, bold color, while it's still wet, draw. The water on the paper is activating it on the tip. Look, look at that effect I got right off the bat. You are gonna love all the cool things that you can do with these. You can also create more than one color, <clears throat> two, three, whatever. I always don't, don't just meet up to it, layer it in between. That's gonna give you a green because we had blue and yellow. When you have more than one color, just go light to dark. If you start in the dark, it's gonna transfer through all of it, sort of like you know when you have mud on your shoes. Look at the range of colors I got all at once with that. <clears throat> you can, let's say this is a tree trunk. First of all, you would never make that kind of a line. You always wanna hit and miss line because you're gonna notice when I wet this, that's all gonna be the same value and indirectly it flattens it. So if you're ever drawing with the pencil to apply color, give yourself hit and miss lines. If you want the whole thing filled in, you just fill in like we did right here. But if you want more than one value right off the bat, notice I am leaving some white. And I'm drawing it lighter. When in doubt, go lighter, because unlike watercolor, when you rewet it, sometimes it'll lift. This pretty well set. So I could put 10 layers on top of this, and none of the previous layers are going to reactivate on you. If you have light and dark in there, again, hit the light first. This is right off the bat and ensure you are gonna have more than one value in here. Now I can make all the lines dissolve so it's smooth, or you can get in and out and not totally dissolve everything. And right off the bat, you've got some lines in two. So there is more than one way that you can do that as well. Ah, uh, you could actually just, like I said, draw lines here and there. If you want them softer, do it on the dry. If you wanted to combine these and even darker lines, can you see how this is a darker value than those? Right off the bat, I've, I'm building dimension as well as interest because I've introduced three different values and totally dissolved color, partially dissolved color and distinct color. The brush alone can't do this guys. You could leave those alone, like I said, or you could just barely come in and only wet them, or you could really wet all of it and a little of those lines are gonna blur out. See the difference? There are so many cool things you can do with these things. Okay, so I got that many done for starters. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about erasers before I forget to. When you're working on watercolor paper, if you use <clears throat> a hard plastic eraser, you are going to disturb the sizing, the top layer of the paper. And when you have uneven sizing, um, the paint is going to grab more in those areas and almost look like a skin knee. So it's very important you treat this paper very delicately. I always use an extra soft white vinyl eraser on all of my watercolor papers. It effortlessly will erase um, your lines. And by the way, here's another hint. A lot of people tend to draw their lines with an HB pencil. HB pencil uh, will give you a light mark but it does have some loose pigment that sometimes can either smear or interact with the paint and muddy that line. So I always go with the 2H. It will give you a light line, light enough you can see, no way it's gonna smear. So when color comes up to it, um, it's gonna be nice and fresh and clear. So I use a Kimberly 2H graphite pencil <clears throat> along with my Extra soft white vinyl eraser. Okay. Kathy, I was just gonna, hi guys, this is Julia. Um, you're doing great so far and I can't wait to see what else uh, you have in store for everyone. But uh, we have a couple questions in here about what paintbrush you were using um, and do certain brushes work better with uh, watercolor pencils than uh, uh, other pigments? Great questions. <clears throat> and by the way, guys, if at one o'clock you have to leave, we totally get it, but we like started 10 minutes late. 
Okay, the difference between um, oil brushes really are created for oil paints, acrylic brushes for acrylic paints, watercolor for watercolor paint. Um, for an example, an acrylic brush, when you load it with paint, it's meant to release all of it at once and then you work it around. Watercolor brushes, let me get some watercolor actually in my brush, here they are. Well, I'm gonna show you this in advance. I showed you on dry paper. If you wanna work on wet paper, obviously drawing with the pencil tip is not the answer. It's gonna give you just bold lines. So one day I thought, what's the difference if I squeeze palette paint out of a tube onto a palette or if I take that 90 pound watercolor paper and draw swatches and then I just activate them. So easy for travel too. Now you can see these are spread out further. I had used those up when it dried. I turned around and just drew more on. So here we go. A watercolor brush, every time you lay it down is meant to drop a little more pigment. Remember when we did this, I said, lay the brush down and just stroke until it all dissolves. If you do this, 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 a lot of people when they watercolor say, I have all this water, it won't, it's not doing what I want. It's because you're tap tapping like you're an acrylic painter. You wanna stroke when you do watercolor. See the difference? Nice, even color and just the right amount of water instead of this boom, boom, boom. And watercolor brushes are either all natural hairs or a mix of natural and synthetic. So they will hold all that watery liquidy paint. Um, the brush I'm using is by Silver Brush Limited. Um, it's a black velvet. It's a 3000S. And I use an H because this has a fat belly and a tapered tip. So I always go, I, I pick the size by how wide I want it to go. So that eight, the belly of this is an eight because you notice with a little pressure, I can make a tiny line, a little more pressure, it's wider, even more pressure, it's wider, and it will fill in. This brush, I only have to have one brush. A lot of other watercolor brushes have a round tip, so it is the same diameter at the tip as it is in the belly. So you'll find you're switching out. I'm working in a small area. Oh, I think I need a two now. So this is why I use, um, uh, the black velvet and I've had this brush over 20 years you know I mean you make more of an investment with the watercolor brush than an acrylic brush but again you're only as good as the tools you work with and and I just I, I love the control and I love the, the longevity of the brush was that helpful hopefully yes um, it's a number eight round and the number of, it's a black velvet 3000S round, okay? Alrighty, so now that I've already introduced my palette technique, I'm gonna show you um, some palette things. How wet the paper is um, will, will designate how crisp the elements are. These flowers way in the background that really, it's just the illusion of a flower, were the paint was dropped in when the paper was really wet. As the paper started to dry, they became a little more distinct. And when it was real dry, there it's, it's very, very detailed. So the wetter the paper, the looser the design's gonna be, the drier the paper, it's going to be very, very, very distinct. This is applied on dry paper. It's not going anywhere. If you wet it first, all right, I'll really wet this one and I'll barely wet this one. See again, just working off my paper palette, really wet. Do you see how it kind of sits and it's going everywhere? This is the drier area. See how it's a little, a little more controlled. So I, you know, when you want something to look diffused way in the background, those are the areas you're going to paint first when it's really wet. And as it starts to dry, it's going to get more and more distinct. 
All right. Working wet also. Here's another mistake everybody makes. Here's our wet. They want, and acrylics, you lay the color down and then you work it until it's exactly where you want it to be. Don't do that in watercolor. Let the water, see how that ebbed and flowed and made all these beautiful um, loose edges. When the two colors meet up, they are gonna give you all those beautiful little edges. So drop it in, in a few spots, rinse your brush, I'll grab some yellow, let that meet up. Again, that's gonna create a different color. And if you just are patient for a few seconds, you are gonna see, these are gonna to totally blend very soft and loose to give you all these unique additional colors. See how one color just sort of runs into the next color, okay? Hopefully you're finding these tips helpful. Now, I can show- uh, There's one question here that says, do you do these wet techniques with other pencils also? No, this is a water media pencil. Um, your charcoals and your graphites and your pastels to create these soft looks, you manipulate them differently. They're, they're dry media. And some dry media pencils, you can dissolve with water, others you can't, okay? Now I'm gonna show you a quick example of palette colors floating together effortlessly, as well as what happens if you draw on the paper when it's wet and when you draw on the paper when it's dry. And then I also wanna show you grading the pencil tip, which is really cool. So I'm gonna work since I'm wetting it, obviously, I'm gonna create my background with my palette. I am, if you want to leave white areas, <clears throat> I'll talk about resist next, but you can lay masking fluid down in an area you totally wanna to preserve just in the initial stages, but eventually you're gonna want to paint in that white area. If you just want to make sure it always stays white, you can do what I'm doing right now, which leave a few dry areas. That water is only, it's gonna go around those dry areas and find more water. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with a little bit of green and then make it light so you can see everything. Pop it in a few spots. Now I'm gonna to go to the blue. That's gonna make me a blue green. Do you see these areas that are staying dry? It's because I didn't wet those areas. Oh, let's make a yellow green in a few. Do you see it's unlimited, a limited palette of colors. You can create all these wonderful additional colors. Now I'm getting picky about where I leave those white spots. So there's my background and see how all those colors are just ebbing and flowing together. Now, while it's still wet, I am going to take a sanding paddle. You can use an emery board if you don't have one. And I'm going to position the tip underneath it and run it back and forth. And I'm going to, I want some kind of gravel in the background of this field. So again, add a little, didn't that add so much more interest than just the color while it's still wet? I take all the water out of my brush and this one I can pinch. If you don't have something that ends up looking like a fan, grab a fan gently like butterfly kisses. You do not want to press hard because you'll just push the pigment into the paper. But if you slightly grab it, you see how it's pulling up some scruffy grasses too. This is what I mean about the unexpected mark. Somewhere in your work, you've created a mark they just are not expecting to see. Now, if I let this dry and then draw taller grass, it's gonna be a little lighter in color, remember? Those are gonna look like this. But if I draw on the paper when it's wet, see how much bolder they are? But you don't get carried away. You want some of them bold. And then when it dries, come back and do some of them the lighter value. Again, you even have more than one value within these little scraggly things. So, isn't that cool? 
Now, broken pencil tips. Don't throw them away, guys. Save them. Takes about a day for them to dissolve. I keep all of my tips. I don't even remember what color this is. Ah, blue, perfect. So let's say I wanted to put my sky in, or let's say this is a lake down here. You see, oh, it's spitting on me, but that's all right. I can turn around and manipulate this spit stuff too. Ooh, ah, come on guys, this is cool. Or I could have just come in here. Actually, I should have pre-wet it. This is gonna be too dark. Or I could have stroked my sky in too. But another cool thing you can do with the tips once you have dissolved them is now we can do subtle backgrounds in our work. We can turn around. Now this one's gonna have little drops. Something's wrong with this baby. I think I need to clean the tip. Do you see how you have a pattern? If it is darker than you want, <clears throat> while it's still wet, just take some paper towel, lay it down. And here's another secret, don't blot it evenly. Take a little out, press harder in certain areas than others because then you'll get more than one value in it. Again, makes it so much more interesting. Here's some examples of sprayed backgrounds. This was a stencil background behind the rose. And while I've got this rose, this is another thing I love about this. It's so easy to come in and add additional control color in just a few spots with the pencil, as opposed to watercolors in the beginning. Let me throw a little, walk this out. Start your water. If you want this to go about to here, start your water way back here. And it's not a lot of water. I got just a small shine going here. And when I dissolve that color, that water, see how that walks that right out? It's so easy and controlled. Now, because this is very light, obviously I wet it first and I used palette color. And then for drama, I came back and did the draw and wet. It's always going to be softer values if you've added it from your palette colors, as opposed to drawing with it with the pencil tip. The color is going to be more saturated. You guys finding these tips helpful? Yes, no, maybe so. Here's another one. This was done with a piece of lace, real thick, cotton lace. I have that lace somewhere here to show you. Yes. Hey, Kathy, there's another question about where did you get the backgrounds, um, these interesting textures and patterns that you're using? Where did I get them? Yes. Um, I thought them up in my head. Um, the first one was stencils. Just there's a, so many stencils out there. But then I wondered, well, what would happen with lace? So, you know, experiment is the key. This actual lace pattern, do you see how much softer this is in areas? For some reason, because it's so thick, maybe it absorbed more of the spray. I'm not sure. I just know I experimented and said, this is a keeper. I wanna be able to do this in more designs. Then I turned around and said, well, what would just like a, a, a paper doily do when you spray? Much more controlled and precise. Why? I do not know. Um, but again, this is what in all my classes, I say, don't be afraid to experiment. Some of the coolest things I've come up with was just, I wasn't in the mood to create an actual piece, but I wanted to get the creative juices going. So I just started playing for, I'm showing you all my success stories. I have a lot of failures guys. Okay. Then it was like cheesecloth. What would this maybe do? Well, you know what, if you're doing um, a lake scene and you want to give the illusion of flowing water with rocks, isn't that cool? I just created the pattern I wanted by, you know, rearranging these strings, laid it down so it would give the movement mark I wanted, hit it with that spray bottle. Okay. I 
started to talk to you about resist. Masking fluid is a resist, but and but if I just want that paper white, remember, um, don't wet that area. The paint will go around it. Or you can take things like a white crayon. Or this is a clear wax crayon. These come in all the Easter egg kits, guys. After Easter, I hit every store when they take the Easter egg dye kits down to 10 cents each and buy like 100. Every one of them have this clear wax crayon in it. So let me get a little color over these and show you. These are fun for mixed media or cards, or I mean, if you're not doing serious, serious work. See how this will also, come on, Kath, a little more paint. Preserve the white of that paper too for you. And another cool trick <clears throat> is General has a white charcoal pencil. It's called a charcoal white pencil. Um, notice I got a flag on it. This is um, dry white pigment. It's not meant to be wet, but I was playing around with it. When you put it on dry, we use it with our charcoal, graphite, you know, all that kind of stuff. You might get a little bit of a line. If you wet the tip of this, and this is why this one has a flag on it. This is the only one I wet all the time because you're not supposed to wet it. That water's wicking up the core. And eventually one of these times you are gonna wet it and it's just gonna break every time because you've compromised that core. But look at that bold white mark. If you get a watercolor done and go, oh, I really wish I would have left the white of the, in that area. This is a, a, a fun way, look, look at that, to bring that white back. And it sets into it, whereas if you use a white acrylic or white gouache, it sits on top and you see that, that hard white edge. You won't with this because it is going to seep right into that paper. <clears throat> Another fun resist is while the paint is still wet, if you sprinkle salt into it, the, the, wherever the salt lands, the pigment's going to go towards it. It's gonna absorb it. And it's going to give you all those kind of little lines like that, okay? If you want it to look looser, <clears throat> when it's all still wet, see how these are much looser, all these little white marks. While my paper was still wet, I just put my hands into my water bin. So there was a little bit on the tips and I just went flick, flick, flick. And so that is a looser, more diffused background for it, okay? Um, the type of paper you're working, Sometimes the artwork looks totally different, like I talked about in the beginning. This was just on the 140 cold press watercolor paper. Now this background, something totally different. This was a stencil. I took my palette knife and this is by DecoArt. Um, it's called liquid glass. And I, well, I laid the stencil down, took my palette knife and over all the openings, I put this. It's a raised clear, I don't know if it's gonna pick it up, but it's kind of shiny. So that was another fun way that I could, and then my watercolors went over it. It also acted like a resist. Can you see that? So the paint just went all around it. Now here's that same exact design. Background done the same, flowers done the same, but I had a watercolor paper that obviously didn't have as much cotton in it because the paint was sitting up on the top more. It just looked washed out. So I needed to make it more absorbent. So I took two parts Elmer's glue, one part water, made myself a soupy mix, just stroked it all over the paper and then put um, rice paper on top of it. Now look at the colors here. Look at how much more textural and bolder they are different surface. So your surface can make a big difference too, okay? When you combine a lot of, of the techniques I've shared with you today, that's another way to get additional interest, okay? You can see palette technique in the background with some salt. These trees were done, done with palette color while it was real wet, do you see? It was the wettest here. And as it dried a little more, they got a little more distinct and a little more distinct. 
the one in the foreground that I wanted really to have punch even has the pencil tip bow strokes. I hope that's showing up for you. Again, in the birch trees, look at how I use that graded technique again. So, you know, that's a way to add depth and interest too, is use more than one technique in the design you're creating. And last but not least, um, don't be afraid to even put like glitter in. Combining glitter, there's that charcoal white pencil, nice and bright, but I even put glitter here. Or there's glitter all in this fun one all around the edges and outline, it's not showing up shiny. There it is for you. So, I mean, they are great mixed media tools too, guys. This, I had some stamped background on. Um, this background was so easy to make. You see all these cool fractured lines? I do at least wanna share that with you. This has some snowflakes too. The stamp was going to be too obvious. So I'm like, no, that's not gonna work. It's gonna fight the center. I want this to be the brightest and then softer and softer, diffuse, diffuse, you know, in the background. You don't want your background fighting with your foreground though. So what I did, like here's a diffused one that was a stencil, all these, I just laid the stencil down and I dabbed matte medium in the open areas. When it dried, then we did this background, which I'm gonna show you real fast. So easy to do. You do it with plastic wrap, you wet your background. And again, this is gonna be a palette technique because I want it really wet. I want these colors to effortlessly just roll into each other. Okay. So, oh, might as well just keep working off this palette. What the heck? I want you to notice how, see how it's all just spreading out. Um, we'll get some green. It will do, and you gotta work fast. The, you know, once that paper starts losing its shine, guys, stop, let it dry, re-wet the whole thing and start all over again. Any old kind of plastic wrap, just do not use microwave plastic wrap. For some reason, it doesn't like to crinkle. Loosely, just lay it down and it's gonna start connecting to the paper all by itself. See how it's making all those fractured lines? Let it do its own thing first. Now, I know I want more. So now I'm gonna start a few smushes here and there until I get the pattern I like. And then you set it to the side till it dries and then you pull it off. And once it dries, it's gonna, it's gonna look like that. This is bolder color. This, I had more water than paint because I wanted it very soft in the background. But I just thought it just, gave it a whole different look. Sometimes I do it to establish a diffused background. Look at right off the bat. You know, these are there's a woods back there and I'm gonna take advantage of some of these and turn these into the hit and miss marks of the branches or the stalks of you know foliage or scruffy trees back there. But it's a real great way to establish plain old distinction too. But even like, you know, uh, putting it in elements right off the bat, instead of my leaves just being one color green and then you build up, look how interesting that leaf looks right now even, before you even define it with the veins and the stem and everything. So you guys finding all this information helpful? Yes, no, maybe so. They seem to be loving it, Kathy. We have uh, in our last 10 minutes, is there anything you wanna go over with um, uh, bringing things out with the pastel pencils in your water? Yes, coat? yes. We got that next right away. And remember, we get more than 10 minutes because we started late. Actually, is my clock wrong? It only says like a quarter to. Uh, it's 1.49 right now. So we have Ooh. a little bit more than that. Okay. Um, I wanted to touch base real fast on how to clean your brush because so many people in watercolor think, oh, it's such a light liquidy uh, paint. Um, it, it, it all rinsed out. Well, I, you know, that's not the case. It's, there's a lot of natural hairs in here. 
the day you wash your hair, how, you know, you have so much bounce in body, right? You want that state for your hairs for your watercolor brush, because if there's little bits of pigment sediment weighing it down, it's going to react like your hair the day you need to wash it, where it's not necessarily greasy, but, you know, heavy weighted, won't move around. So this brush cleaner, you're going you're gonna to see a green tint come out of this. You, we thought all that paint was out, but it wasn't. There, I wish you could see it's not showing up more. There is green coming out in this. So you want to get all of it out. And for oils or acrylics, even sometimes people like to put sizing back in. Once you have it totally clean, give it another coating and you can shape it. And it will dry kind of firm. And so it protects the hairs. Uh, now in watercolor, you're gonna to wanna to rinse that out before you start painting. Same with your acrylics. If you were doing this after oil painting, you, you just sort of go like this to, to you know, loosen the hairs up. You can dip that right into oil paint right off the bat. Um, it is not gonna make a difference, okay? Um, I do know that they carry both our soap, which I'm gonna go into with pastels. Well, I'll just talk quick about it. Um, as well as the brush cleaner and stain remover. Oh my gosh, I did a whole cleanup video, guys. You wanna talk about uses for everything in the house from automotive grease to all your art needs, to your shoes, anything. These products are amazing. And what I love about the hand soap the most, especially with all my mixed meat and everything else is um, a lot of regular soap dries my hands out super bad. This soap, uh, effortlessly takes oils, grease, paint, everything out. My hands never dry out with this. I will even clean brushes in a bind with this. I clean all of my, my tools that I've been using media and it smells like spearmint. Oh. So I, I just can't stress enough how I feel this rates right up with your, your brushes. All of these things, how you take care of the supplies that you've invested in is, is, I mean, it's a world of difference, okay? Now, as we said, we want you to go back and watch Julia. Julia did the first pastel video. Um, again, we ran out of time or we looked at all the questions afterwards. A lot of people were confused about paper surfaces, okay? Um, there is, and I even wrote it down for you guys, Strathmore, is, it's a tone paper, lots of times, we use this in our charcoal drawings, but you can also put pastels on it. This is the finished one of that on that piece of paper, okay? Why I chose this is it shows very soft diffuse pigment. It shows blocked in color, but it, and linear colors as well. There are so many ways to apply it. This one was just all blocked in, okay? I loved combining a few different ways of walking. That's one color just walked out to get lighter, lighter and lighter in value and then linear on top of it, okay? So there is tone paper. Then there is something called Me Tense pastel paper. And just like watercolor paper, there is a smooth side and a textured side. And I'm gonna just lay a little color down on these to show you right off the bat. Let me move these two. We'll go on to them. The smooth, the textured side, I know, again, are all those little hills and valleys kind of showing up? You there. Can you see them? So it's going to, the hill's going to have less, less pigment. The valley's going to have more, okay? So and this is another reason I love general pastel pencils. I do believe Michaels does do the 12 and 24 sets too. Nice little trays just slide right out. You get a little red all art sharpener. There's a reason the sharpener's in here, guys. <clears throat> Two things make a good sharpener, the type of the blade and the angle of the blade. The little red stainless steel German blade. So it's effortlessly going to sharpen this delicate pigment core. Second thing, it's angled to give you the exact point that you get coming out of the box. You don't really 
want to expose a real long tip in your pastels, especially if you're heavy handed, it's just gonna break off. So you just want a small, evenly exposed amount all the way around, okay? So, and you look for dusting. This is what allows you to move it. This is what I mean by dusting, smearage for lack of a better word. But can you see the hills and valleys? Sometimes we smear with our fingers. You can smear with, believe it or not, makeup sponge. This is gonna be a lighter value. See, how, oh, that a green in it. But can you see that's lighter than this? Your finger embedded it into the paper. This embedded it, but partially absorbed it. A cotton ball is going to absorb even more. Then you have blending stumps as well as tortillions. A tortillion, the only time you wanna work off the tip is to get in a really tight little area or to define a line because it embeds it. You wanna get used to drop, drop it, pick it up, lay it on its side. See how my two fingers are holding it? And like you're frosting a cake, you're embedding it first. Then I like to straddle with the white of the tortillion on the white of the paper, the dirty on the very edge. And this is how I can pull it up and it's gonna get lighter and lighter and lighter. Now, if I wanted to really tighten that tip up, that's what you use the tip of this for. Does that make sense? Blending stump will absorb a little more pigment. Again, it's more absorbent than the paper, okay? So that's one way to do it. Now for extracting it, again, that ES20 is excellent, but if you want to do tight detailed areas, where are you hiding my BM2? Oh, here you are. Oh, and it's dirty. So I'm going to clean it, lay it on its side. Then on the other side, I love that these are self-cleaning <clears throat> and it will effortlessly extract that out without um, hurting the paper at all. That's one way to do it. Or <clears throat> you can bring the whites out again by drawing with a white one. That's not gonna show up on that light color. It'll show up better on the other paper. Um, so that, you, you see the texture. You see that texture coming through? This is what I mean by, if it's like that would, would look great on a tree trunk or something, having that texture showing through, not on a flower petal. Here's the smooth, do the same thing. I won't fill the whole thing in, but you'll get an idea of you get a totally different look on its side. Let's blend it as we're bringing it up lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. See how that's smoother? You don't see all those little hills and valleys as much. <clears throat> then on this design, this was on the um, tone paper instead. Um, it grabs even less, so it's gonna be a little lighter. What I did to create all these was, I started it just down at the bottom. And again, less is more. The more you lay down, the darker the value is going to be. So then I came in here on its side, light touch, heavier touch if you want to embed it, light touch if you want to really allow yourself to be able to move it a lot further. Spin your work. I find it easier to come towards me. So the more texture of the paper, the more it's going to grab the pigment, the darker the value is going to be. See, I'm not in the, let's get the light again. Come on, there we go. Can you see how much lighter that is than this? Okay. And then I came back with my charcoal white pencil and I brought those lines in. You want to follow the shape of it. Brought them up from both edges. And then 
once you get all of them filled in, you would come in bolder, little more pressure. See how that is a darker white? And just on the tip, I wanted that much more condensed, but you come in different lengths with it. You don't want it just like they all stop evenly right here. Again, you're gonna follow that curve. And sometimes it takes a few times of doing that. Now, can you see how this one is super bright, brighter than these even? I, I wet the tip. When all was said and done, if there was just a few little areas that I wanted <clears throat> brighter than the rest, I even wet the tip of my charcoal white pencil and did that. If it gets too light, you don't ever hesitate. Now see, this is a rounded tip. I wanna come in and do a few thin marks. So I have to give it a quick sharpen. One, two, three. Do you see how effortlessly this sharpens? A sharpener, a good sharpener makes all the difference in the world. You know, you can keep coming in and out and adding more or less depending how bold or light you want something. Same thing with the center. Start with your lightest color if you're going to be putting several colors in. Now there's two ways to do it. If you wanna alter the darker colors, like we did right here slightly, fill the whole thing in yellow first and then draw over the yellow and for the second color and over the second color for the third color. It's really up to you. I will do it where I draw over each color on the top and I'll separate it on the bottom. Um, the second color was burnt sienna. I'll block that in. This is what I mean by blocking in colors. <clears throat> These I blocked in next to each other. This one I'm gonna lay right on top of the yellow and you're gonna see it's gonna have a slightly different value than this. I always like to keep more than one tortillion. This is my yellow one. I was using the blue one before. Start in the center, kind of embedded a little bit. Do the top one first. And less is more. Right off the bat, I'm like, yeah, I really wanted a little more. Notice different amounts. They're not all the same width. That makes a difference too. Now let's blend this one, sandwich them, meet them into each other. See how that's a darker value, that's a lighter value. And then you come in with your darkest color last, even in a smaller amount. You always wanna be able to see a little bit of the previous color showing. And that's basically pastels. Or you can, you don't even have to blend. You can just start blocking all those colors in like I did on the stem. See, the blocked in color looks more opaque than the blended color, okay? And to block those in, you just start with your lightest color first and then work around it. Always put the lightest in the center. And Julie, I do believe did a sphere in the one video that she did previously to share with you guys. And it, whether it's a severe, a sphere or a stem or anything, remember we, the illusion that it's round, you're gonna have your lightest area and then your mid values and then your darks and then actually your mid values on the edge again. So I could, this, now what I'm doing is I am blending just with the tip by overlaying in some areas. So you don't always have to, you know, have a blending tool. Do you see how all these colors are starting to blend just by laying over each other a little bit, coming back in over color. Let's throw a little blue in there because blue is in the flowers. It's always great to introduce colors uh, that you've used in other areas in additional elements, helps marry it all together. 
it looks really dark to me on the screen, but what I'm looking at is not this dark. But see, all those colors are blending together too. So there's several different ways to blend. This one shows a lot of blending using that BM2 eraser to pull out highlights. And charcoal, the addition of charcoal. You, you know, you can mix your mediums together, guys. Um, you can like simple pen and ink designs, cards, uh, journal pages where you've got inking. Once you have all your design drawn or inked in, you can just, you know, block a little bit of color and blend it with your fingers. I do believe with this one, I did what I did in the background here, which was I took my blue pencil and that sanding paddle again. And I graded the pigment in a few spots. And then I took my cotton ball, set it down lightly, and I rouged with it. For a nice soft cool effect. And that's what I did in this one. I basically, I think I graded some of the colors and even just used my cotton ball maybe for that one. I did not show you the last paper, which is the Me Tense Touch. This is almost like, can you hear it? Sandpaper. And notice it grabs even bolder, so bold, because it's like working on emery paper almost. You, I mean, look how instantly it's that dark. Blend with your finger. Super Bowl blend with a tortillion. And this time was just block the colors together. Remember I said, you don't have to, I had this color and then I picked up my light blue, met it up and overlaid it. Now I could blend with my finger, light to dark, or I could have just come in and kept adding additional in the areas that I wanted. As I get close to the color next to it, lighten up on your pressure. And those, those colors will meld together too. They're just, it's going to be a much bolder color because so much more pigment has been laid down here than here. Does that make sense, guys? Yes, no, maybe so. Are we getting any comments to let me know if they understood? Is everybody else froze? I'm not hearing anything. No, you're doing great, Kathy. And uh, everyone's just giving you uh, compliments right now and saying it makes sense. Okay, and now last but not, so remember, play around with those pastels. And like I said, not, you know, another thing I love about generals is besides I've got the artist quality, the price point, it beats all the competitors. Um, I don't know why, you know, uh, could be we're made right here in the USA. It doesn't cost as much. And, you know, as much as it costs a company indirectly, that cost is passed down to the consumer. Um, but they have not let me down even back from my college days when professors were the ones that told me to use this product. So to reiterate again, you can just, you know, lay it down, finger blend, cotton ball, blending stump or tortillion, makeup sponge. The harder the surface, the darker the color is going to be. The softer, remember, because it's going to absorb part of it. So that's a way to control value. Remember, you can come back. I could come back right now and say, oh, that's not as dark as I want. You can continually build. So less is more. Now, by bringing that second value in, I did not have to blend that edge out. There's times you have to blend the edge out. There's times you don't. Okay, so the surface is going to make a difference. The pressure, how much you layer down, and your blending tools. They not only create beautiful artwork all by itself, I bring them over into my watercolors a lot. Do you see how bright these yellows are.
because I wanted this super bold mixed media background with all this raised netting and everything, it needed more pop. No matter how much watercolor I put down, that background was so much. Look at all these extra pop accents are the pastel on top of the watercolor. Right here, this stem was like this one, just fell into the background. I needed to bring it forward again by taking a little bit of a pastel and laying it on top. Do you see how that brightened that area? I use pass and, and you can't see it, but you see how that's bringing this back into the foreground? That is another great, great hint to show you guys how to bring things back into the foreground more. Let's put some pastel over it. The last example to show you, again, this started out of watercolor. The mountains were either too bright or too washed out. So I came back and said, I'm gonna pop them with pastel. That's all pastel accents that I controlled. They're not too bold by the way I applied them. So it kept them in their plane, but it added so much more interest to this. All right, any qu last minute questions at the end for anything? I'm hearing some questions about the paper used. Uh, what is the difference between the watercolor paper and the pastel paper? Okay, watercolor paper is, and, and all papers, it says, either it says sketch paper, drawing paper, uh vellum illustration paper um the paper is meant for the to accept a specific pigment your watercolor paper has cotton linton fibers in it i mean it almost i mean it almost feels like cloth if you have a high quality watercolor paper arches 140 cold press is my choice for watercolor paper, okay? For pastel, pastels, a dry media, so therefore it can go on a dry media surface. This was Strathmore toned paper, comes in all these different colors, very smooth. Notice this square though, that was the ticket. That was the label I took off. And I didn't notice it until I graded the pigment and put that on. So obviously there was something in the adhesive that coated that small area of the paper. This is what I mean about your surfaces. You gotta treat them delicately because they make or break a piece, okay? So that was the tone paper. And then um, this was the meat tense pastel paper. Um, there are other types out there. Julia, chime in if you know of other pastel papers that you like to use. This is how it looked like on the smooth side. This was on the textured side. You see more of the hills and valleys, okay? Think, um, you are generally for like the really sanded ones because they have a lot of different grades. Um, those, that's just what I have on hand, um, but that's something to look into as well. Is you are still making paper? I, last time I checked. Okay, good, because I didn't pull my you are out because I know at one point in time, and that's all handmade paper too by this family. Um, she was really ill and I didn't know if they were gonna continue it. That's why I, oh, when, okay. when, when Me Tents came out with their touch, and again, here, it's sandpaper. It just, it, it just grabs so much more. So the more textured the paper, the more pigment it's gonna grab initially, the color's gonna be brighter, but not only that, the more layers of pigment it will accept. You're gonna notice with the smoother papers, you gotta have a game plan because sometimes you only get two or three layers and then it just won't accept any more paper. You know, it just won't accept any more pigment. Oh, which reminds me to see, you do not need to see a watercolor guys. The majority of watercolor just goes under glass. If you're doing um, a card or whatever, if you wanted to put, um, a thin coating of spray fixative, Krylon spray fixative on, you could, but you know, if it's not gonna get soaking wet, it is, it's, it's good to go, it's, it's protected. Pastel, however, is gonna smear more. You know, this, see, that's still gonna smear more. 
so, ooh, 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 I don't think I pulled one out. Let me grab my folder. You can either use spray fixatives, um, Krylon spray fixative. If you're gonna do a spray fixative, shake the can really good. I always put a little color on the very edge and test first, because you just never know what's gonna happen. Um, hold it at least six, at least six inches, closer to 10 at least and a very thin spray. You're not looking to totally saturate it because you'll get little puddles if you hold it too long in one area. And again, it's gonna turn into liquid and smear it. So real thin coat going horizontally, let it dry, and then do a thin coat vertically. And then you should be able to see a tiny little shine that's covered everywhere. If not, repeat the process going both ways, but a light mist. It's a slow buildup. Um, Julia, if you have another way that you do it, shout out, how do you seal your pastels? I generally just use a Krylon work fixative. If it's on like yeah. paper with, um, with my charcoals, uh, but with pastels, it's always a little trickier because you can lose some pigment and stuff. So always make sure you do it on a test piece first before you do yeah. any of um, so see, he says the same thing, guys. And another reason I don't like spray, I try not to use spray fixative, especially your warm colors, uh, your yellows, oranges, and reds. You know, you have this beautiful piece, gorgeous apple, so dimensional. Warm colors tend to fade a little bit with, with fixatives and it can just change the whole look of your piece. So then I said, well, what can you use instead? So then I'm like, well, what did Leonardo use? I mean, what did they use before all these things were invented? And they burnished everything. So this is just good old fashioned tissue paper from the dollar store. Lots of times one side shiny, and one side is dull. You want the dull side down, the shiny is partial wax. Lay it down and grab a metal tablespoon, soup spoon, whatever and put your fingers like to hold it taunt and start rubbing and rub and rub and rub and rub with pressure. A smear occur, the only thing a smear is this, the excess, excess pigment sitting on top of the paper that has apps, it's got nowhere to go. So it sits there and it's gonna create a smear. This is pushing all those particles into the paper and what the paper cannot absorb the tissue paper does, and then you won't smear. Ta-da! That's, that's my super tip of the day. Um, again, um, I cannot stress enough about this soap. I, I mean, like even right now, I, I'm gonna have to clean up. Amazing. We have one in the house, in the garage, in the art kit, everywhere, from grease to sap, to all my mediums, to even my pencil pigments. Um, it makes such a difference really getting it off your hands, but also condition them at the same time. Um, I was going to say one more thing and it came in and went, gosh, oh, um, we have a whole video, uh, um, a, a fun video we did for Michael's months back was went into every kind of cleaning product, every type of art material it will remove or possibly correct stains or whatever it really is worth watching make sure you watch julia's pastel video too because i i didn't share the same information you know she gave you such a great start um my pastel portion was filling in on a lot of the questions that didn't get addressed the first time around so between the two you should have a good basic understanding of pastels. And then basically guys, it should, you, you play, you know, just, just like with painting, your strokes get better the more you do it. Your drawings get more precise the more you practice. It's the same whether you're with your pastel pencils as, or your charcoals and graphites. And watercolor too. Water, water, water is the key. You gotta have a good quality watercolor, hopefully watercolor pencil. Um, too much water, you are going to lose control or too much water. If your paintings always end up looking so light, it's you have 
your water ratio is more than your pigment ratio. So back off on the water. Um, if you love the color, the minute you lay it down, it, it's too light. Watercolors dry one or two values lighter. So that's, that's another great tip. If you love it when you first see it, it it's gonna dry softer, okay? Um, now I'll switch to me. The reason I didn't is lots of times it makes my camera freeze when we've had prior connection problems. We're gonna try. Let's see if it did show me, but it also showed my messy studio. I didn't think of that. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Um, again, questions, feel free to email me. www.gentlepencil.com, guys. They have, we have so many cool videos. It's worth perusing them. Some are artists in action. Some are actually where they did visits to the factory. You get to see this product getting made. It's so cool. Um, Julia, did I forget anything else? I don't believe so. I think you did a great job and uh, I will keep posting these links um, in the chat here. Um, but you guys should have it all uh, in your emails um, anyway. So be sure to check that out. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Milan, anything else you wanna say to close this out? Yeah, um, we put the links, me as well as Julia put the links to the channel and everything else, like she said, should be in your email. Um, your email was also dropped in the chat, Kathy. So if anyone has any questions or anything, they can message you. Um, but thank you again so much for everyone joining in. We apologize for the technical difficulties that we had in the beginning and starting late, but we're so happy that you all got to enjoy this class. Again, make sure that you can see the video on our YouTube channel and our website in 24 to 48 hours. So thank you everyone again. Thank you, Kathy and Julia, and we will see you in the next one. Bye guys. Bye-bye.